first name? Lawrence. Lawrence. Okay, this is September 16th, 1985. This is Joe Todd and interviewed Mr. Lawrence C. Barr in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mr. Barr, where were you born? I was born in Joplin, Missouri. And which birthday? April the 29th, 1920. 1920. Who's your father? Arthur Barr. And your mother? Blanche. What was her maiden name? Wood. Wood. Where are your parents from? Joplin. Both from Joplin? Okay. What kind of work did your father do? He a miner. So he worked in the mines up. Okay. Do you know did you know your grandparents? Um, yeah, but they died before I was old enough to really remember. Yeah. Okay. Um, where did you start school? Uh, a little school east of the south of Trace called Bluebird. Bluebird. And what year did you start school? I guess when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember your teacher's name? One of them's name was Darty. Norris C. Darty. Mm -hmm. As a small boy, what chores did you around the home? Do what now? What chores did you around the house when you were a small boy? Well, this Keep the yard clean is about all until uh, my dad always had a garden in the summertime. I worked in the garden. When I got a little older, I got me from what we called herding cows, and I herded those cows for a while, I don't know, a year or two. You have hogs? Did you raise hogs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always had a hog. We always butcher the hog every winter. What time of year you say you butcher in the winter time? That's right. Explain how you butcher a hog. Well, you get the first thing you do, you get yourself some kind of a platform to lay the hog on after after you knock him in the head. Cut his throat. Then you souse him down in that barrel to make to make the hair let loose. A couple of guys scrape him. You hang him up, gut, gut the hog. Of course, after he cools down, why? Then you have to cut him up. Why do you have to let him cool down? Well, it, it, the meat cuts better. You can't cut hot meat. How do you uh, cure your hands? We always cured them with salt. Salt? Mm -hmm. we, we, we never did smoke any. What made you decide to go into the mines? That's all there was around Petra at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, was this in the Depression when you started working the mines? The things was pretty tight in 1938. How did the Depression affect you and your family? We didn't have any money. We only had about all we could eat. My dad always had a job someplace. But we, we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. I don't know of anybody that did. The time is pretty hard around Joplin. You've been kidding. What's the first job you had in the mine? I was a machine helper, or what we called a dummy. And I, worked, and I went to work at the old Mary M. Beck on East 8th Street. Now, where, where's this? It's the east of, east of Pitcher. Oh, Dan Pitcher. Mm-hmm. And I walked before I lived about three miles to the mine and back. Now what, I worked eight hours a day, six days a week. What are the duties of the dummy? What do you do? Well, they're just a machine helper, pneumatic drill, helper. Mm -hmm. 
I helped on this on this machine. Now, what kind of machine is it? What is it? It's, it's a rock drill. What we use to drill rock with, and then we uh, drill about a two and a quarter inch hole, and then we would load this hole with with powder or what they call dynamite. Then we blast it and uh, shoot this rock out. What's the safety in? zone? How far that beat from that hole when you blast? Oh, if you know what you're doing, 300 feet. Because so it didn't throw rock very far. Well, if you know what you were doing. Well, are these slope mines or shaft mines? They're shaft mines. How deep? Approximately 300. They, they buried. Okay. And how do you get the men down in the mine? They let them down on a, on a can with a with a hoist and a derrick. Mm -hmm. A derrick over the shaft. And then it, Would you tell me what your average day in the mine was like from the time you started to the time you finished? Just your average day. You mean how, how long? Yeah, what the different jobs you had, what you did well, in the day? Well, like we went to work, both miners and uh, all went to work at 7 30 in the morning. And uh, we got 30 minutes for lunch. And uh, of course, and then we got, got off at 4 o'clock. And of course, it, it was dark and damp. Well, some of them would come out for lunch, some of them wouldn't. Now, they were still using mules in the mines. Yes. You didn't work with mules? I've worked around them. I never did. Now, what do the mules do in the mine? What are their, what's their job? Well, they had, a, they had a light gauge track. And um, anyway, they had these cars, mining cars, that just sat on the track. And they had hooks on, on the on the cars and they set these cans, what they call sick the biggest part of the place is used what they call the sixteen fifty. What is that? What's uh, I, I guess that meant sixteen hundred and fifty pounds of rock is what they would hope. Mm -hmm. But anyway they hook them, they fill them up and then they hook these cars together and this mule had a mule driver or skinner, mule skinner, mm -hmm. and he pulled these into the shaft on this light on this track. And and of course they hook these cans onto the on the cable and pull them out, dump them in the hopper. How many cans can the mule haul? I've seen them pull lots of them, 20, 20, 20 cars. That's they tell mules. Yeah. How big are the? Uh, how big are the mines inside? Well, uh, they buried anywhere from just just pull drifts, just big enough that you could get up. You might say get an old mule down them. His ears are hitting the the roof then. So. Maybe a foot on each side of the cans, mm -hmm. what they call a pull rip. So I've seen them, it would be 100 foot wide and 150 foot high. What we call, we cut them high and dry. And that's when they got dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because we couldn't, we couldn't keep them trimmed up. And anytime air hits that rock, it slacks, turns loose, especially if it's soapstone or any water to get into it. Well, it'll get it'll get dangerous and it'll and then you get a slab started and I've seen them peel for a hundred foot long and fifty foot wide and twenty foot thick. What do you do then? You just better not be there when it happens. Tell me about some of the mine disasters. What 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 happens in the mine? Well most generally that somebody got a rock on them or what they call a slab, they get uh, there has been a few that got shot by getting careless, loading holes, you know, powder men. Most of them somebody that's wild haired and didn't pay attention to what he was doing. Uh, Use a spike nail for a ferrule on a tamp bar instead of a copper ferrule. And, uh, but that's the way most of them. You have to tamp the dynamite in the hole? Sure did. And you say you have to use a copper nail instead of a knife. Yeah, you should. That's what you're supposed to use. You're not supposed to use anything that's armed and cause spark to set that off. And sometimes they, there has been a few that's, that's done that. And now, how much dynamite do you put in this hole? Any worse from 10 or 15 sticks. I use, I have loaded holes with three boxes. 
which would be 150 pounds of 60 gel. Now, what's 60 gel? Well, that's high, high powered stuff. The rest of it we just called the sawdust, which was 30, 40 percent power. I don't know just what the percentage was on it. But I'll know I have loaded them with three boxes. What brand did you use? Yeah, what, what brand did I use? Oh, it was mostly only Hercules or DuPont. Who was it made? I don't know. We had some powder one time because they did have some places that gold, what they called, was gold metal, was the name of it. Then they had some that was made in Webb City, Missouri, mm -hmm. which was pretty bad to smoke. How many different jobs were in the mine? How many men in the mine? Well, I've seen as high as 60 to, to one shack in one mine. And what are the different jobs? From the boss all the way down? Well, he generally always had to. General superintendent. Then you had a. What does he do? What is the well, he, he's over. He's over the whole ball of wax. And then you've got to have what you have. A, say a coffee herder. What does he do? Well, he was just over the hand shovels when they had hand shovels. That's before we used any power equipment. And then uh, you had the machine men and their helpers. And you had a, generally at least one roof trimmer. Now, what does a roof trimmer do? Well, he goes around over the mine and tries to spot loose rock in the roof. And he's a man that's able to climb a ladder. Which, which generally was, uh, you know, you could, uh, I worked off of five sections of ladder. How, a, how high is that? They string out 72 feet. Those mines get pretty high then, then. That's right. I've seen drifts so high that you couldn't reach them with a, with a ladder, with a 72 foot ladder. After Rye Island. Mm -hmm. How many? And the Mary M. Beck boat. You couldn't reach them with a, you couldn't reach them with a, with a five section ladder. And that's as long as I ever seen. You never named all the different jobs. Yeah, what are the, the different jobs inside the mine? Some well, grenades. You had string uh, down in the ground, why? Well, then you had track men, what's called track monkeys, mm -hmm. and mule scanners. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's, that's about the size of it. And then you had, and then the, some of those had helpers, you know. Chair. No. But uh, the main the main guys in the in the mine most generally we, we had to, we had hand shovels what they called we used to get them out of blue jacket and Jay and Welch and all them we called them surf bucket miners surf bucket miners mm -hmm. they would come in there they lived on a farm out there they carried their lunch in they a would they bucket. would actually come in there with a put their lunch in a surf bucket with a gallon surf bucket during hard times. The depression was well, we bought lots of hair roll surf and a gallon bucket. And they always had to have had their surf bucket and they had them a sandwich in there and a half of sandwich. A lot of them I've seen them, many of one of them come in there with a with a an old slab side of salt pork and a cold biscuit. Dried salt pork. That's all they had. And uh, but anyway they was but they didn't stay long. But they always just come in, you know, when in all times in the farm. They because their main source of income was on the farm. Mm -hmm. And they lived on those little those little farms out there, which was which was then was the fam what we call the family farm. Yeah. There's no such thing as a family farm anymore. Well, don't get into that. Um how big are these mines underground? How far do they go? They uh you could go from, uh, if it had to been for any water or cave-ins, I know you could have went from the Rial old mine to the, to the old, back east, to the Dardine in the back, and I think they finally <coughs> cut it, I know they did, they cut it through plumb into the, uh, 
difficult to come to the uh, probably to the leopard. How far is that? Uh, that'd be two miles, about two miles west of Baxter. That's all underground. Mm -hmm. All underground. Baxter's in Kansas. And that that would be where we're in Kansas, which would be approximately three miles. That's a crow flies underground. Of course, you said would probably take <laughs> if you could had to walk it and get through. But there was a lot of water. You know, some of them filled up in the water in low places and stuff How like that. How do you keep the water out of the mines? Had pumps. How big are these pumps? Well, I used to work on a six-inch triplex, which is an old piston pump. Grease slingers, as we call them, and then uh, I worked on. I would run pumps of about six inch triplex, Camerons, centrifugals. I pumped at the uh, run pumps at the old Leopard, west of Baxter Springs, and pumped that rusty water out. We had two ten inch Pomona's, a six inch triplex, a Cameron, and two and a two inch centrifugal. It wasn't rusty water; it was alkali water. Anyway, uh, it was what it was rusty water, what I just called it rusty water, but it was alkali water. And it ran over east and across the military in Baxter and into Spring River. And I run the, I run the pumps there for a while. Well, I know you forgot to mention the horse trimming. Well, it wasn't in the ground. No, but he gets you up and down. What does he do? He, uh, well, we had the, we had the horse to that, uh, that run the horster on top, mm -hmm. you know, in the dairy. And that's down in the can, down in the... Mm -hmm. sure How is. many men get in this can? Four. 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 I've seen as high as six right here, but two standing on the rim. But actually four of them was what was supposed to ride in the can. I've seen more than that get in the can, but ordinarily four is what you're supposed to. This is the last... The last mine that was left standing up there called we saw i think that's called what we saw that's an old the last one standing one now what what build what does this building do what is this this is a dairy mm -hmm. this is a hopper is that right mm -hmm. this is a shaft where they go up and down into the ground okay now what what's a hopper used for what's well, the hopper is where they where they dump this dirt, and I don't never did know just how many cans that that hopper would hold. Uh, my guess is probably somewhere around eight nine hundred. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it would hold any more than that. Now, after it's taken from the can into the hopper, where does it go? Some of the places you used to have a mill right there at the dairy. They had a mill there, like the Rialto did at one time. They had mills, and it went right into the mill, and the rest of the waste all went out on the tailing pile, and then uh, the the lead in the zinc, and had the, it, it went in the ore bins. Now, how does the mill operate? How does it crush up the rock and all that? Well, what this, this rock, it goes through a, it goes through what they call the breaker. Crusher. Crusher, and that busts these big boulders. How did they crush it? Well, it's just a, two jaws coming, a jaw coming together like that, the bus and these bolts. Then we had a set of had a set of rolls, and it went through the rolls. How did they work? What did they? Well, uh, this rock rolled off into the into the rolls, and these rolls are rolling, and it as it went in their way, it crushed it. Then they had what they called a ball mill. Mm -hmm. After that, some of this rock had pour in it that was so fine that. Uh, they couldn't get it out any other way, so it went into the ball mill, and they floated it out with float machines. Now, I'm not a mill man, but I, I've been through them, you know, and kind of watched it, but I, I never did work in one. Never did work in a mill, because it didn't pay money enough. How many pounds of letters ink can you get out of, like, a ton of ore? Uh, I've seen zinc or it sometimes it'd be I'd say eighty percent zinc. And I've seen lead 
where we would shoot lead out. Maybe the, this vein of lead would be, I've seen it as high as a foot and a half thick. And the dirt would be plum blue. It would be blue. And it would be so heavy that you couldn't pick up a shovel full of it. How many I've, seen, I've seen chunks of it that you go to reach down to pick it up and you didn't pick it up. It wouldn't be over maybe twice as big as a water bucket and you couldn't pick it up. It's just, it's just so much lead in there. How many pounds could a man shovel in one day? A good a good shoveler could uh, could shovel about, if he was really good, could shovel about between 70 and 80 cans. That's by hand. By hand. Of course, when we've got power equipment, I've seen them load as high as 150. Yeah. One, one show, or one operator. Mm -hmm. Now, in the coal mines, they have black lung. What do you have in the lead and zinc mines? We have what they call uh, silicosis, which is rock dust on your lungs. We, when I was a kid, we always called it the roof. Mm -hmm. They always say so and so's got the roof. So it's but just. There was nothing in the world but silicosis. Is so it rock meant, dust on the, on the lungs? Rock dust on their lungs. They got it from being in tight places in those mines. They wasn't cut together then. And the fumes off the powder and the dust was bad. No circulation. Did you have any way to force air down in those mines? They had uh, they had blowers in. They've had, ever since I can remember, they've had blowers. And then they'd maybe run a sail down the drift. Now what's a sail? Well, it would just be a cloth pipe, what we call a sail and uh, force air down a drift, like up in the end of a pool drift, to blow it out some, you know. But it always took time to get that all up there, because if they left it hang, some wild-haired machine man would shoot it all to pieces. He'd load his holes a little heavy and shoot it up, and it took time to get it in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another trouble we had was with some of them wouldn't wet the dirt pile down. No. What does it do? What does wetting the dirt pile down do? Well, it's the rock you would say we shot out today in the, in the morning. Why they wouldn't water it down, and it would be dusty. And when you watered it, it settled the dust. Of course, when you watered it down, it settled the dust some, you know. But it was anytime you move dust and throw it around or dirt and throw it around like that, you're going to have some dust. And uh, we always had problems. Like now, do you take your own lunch in the mine with you? Do each miner take his own lunch? That's right. Take his own lunch. Yeah. And then you, some of them eat out in the doghouse. Some of them, with, like the shovelers or uh, shovel off when, when we first shovel or started and had the hand shovelers. Why, they always took their lunch in the ground because they didn't want to lose any time. They wanted to get shoveled every can of dirt they could. Because every time they got one, why, in my time when I started, around nine, ten cents is what they got. Every time they got one, that's another dime, and they needed every dime. Well, how do you how do you keep track of how many can't you? They had sure. paddles that made out of powder boxes. So the, these powder boxes, like we got dynamite in, mm -hmm. and they made a, a board about uh, about three about three inches wide and about six, seven inches long, kind of sharpened them on the end, and Every hand shovel had a number, like one, two, and on up. And you put your number on okay. on these boards, and then when they're on these paddles, and then when it went into the shaft, well, the tub of it, why he tallied this number mm -hmm. on the board. But uh, Joe Blow had so many, so many cans of dirt that day—50, 50, 55, 60, whatever he had shoveled—and he got so much. And then the the Cokey herder, he always took that tally and turned it in. And they got so much for every can. What's a Cokey herder? Yeah, what is that? Well, a Cokey herder, he's just a guy that he just, he's the boss over the hand shoulders. That's all. Or, or, or at least he never had anything to do with me. Yeah. Because I was, a, <laughs> I was a machine man and. Uh, the biggest part of the time, outside of what time I wasn't a roof trimmer, I'd done a lot, quite a bit of roof trimming too because I was good. 
and I was, I was small, and I could, I know how to handle a ladder, which is very, was, you know, kind of rare. Most guys are, are afraid of heights, and I, at 40 feet foot never bothered me, and I always got more money for it. What's the doghouse? Well, that's uh, the, just a building on top. Uh, I guess you're talking about on, on top where we change clothes. The yeah. morning. And that's the doghouse. That's the doghouse. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, some of the places had showers in there, had hot and cold water. If we could find somebody to build a barn to keep it, to keep the water. You on. mean back in the thirties, they had hot and cold running water in there? Some of them did. Anyway, uh, but. Uh, they had in their houses. They didn't have hot and cold running water in their houses. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then we had a dog house in the ground right at the bottom of the shaft where that they, uh, just a platform, it's all it was, just wooden foot platform. Lots of times it wouldn't be over four or five foot square, maybe ten foot long, something like that. But where they set the can, where they set the empty can on. And they always rolled the, the car in with the loaded can underneath the shaft, which was supposed to have been centered in the center of the shaft. And the hooker, he would hook this loaded can on, the, on, the, in, on his cable. they pulled pull it out. Then he would roll the empty off on the car. And then they had a what's called a bumper, which pulled this empty out and he'd shove another load back under there. Was the man the bumper? Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the way that worked. And then later on, we got what we call shuttle cars which was operated by air. And we, we got rid of the bumpers and they built a hopper in the ground. This dirt went into this hopper on in the ground and the, the hooker always had to, to load his own cans. Mm -hmm. They kind of got it mechanized, you know, to work. They could cut out, cut out a couple of dollars, which the mining companies was 400%. Uh, now you say your father was a miner also. That's right. What were the major changes in the mine from the, your father's time to your time? Well, uh, when I first started, it, it, it had been uh, that been about the same all the time from the time I started up until when I started, and then, uh, and then we started getting power equipment like air shovels. And uh, wasn't but a, a year or two till we got diesel trucks in the ground. Uh -huh. And then we got these diesel loaders. How'd you get diesel trucks down the lines? They cut them. There was no cabs on them. And they just cut them up. You just let the frame down with a motor on it. And then they let the bed down. And then they put it on down there. They assembled them down so there. They assembled the trucks in the ground. That's right. Of course, there was nothing on them, no fenders. If they got a fender on them, why? They, some welder down there had to put it on. Ever been a cave in? I've been within a couple hundred feet of one. Why that? Knocked me down. Happened at the old Mary M. Beck. There was a Slab of rock fell. It was probably 150 foot long, 50 foot wide, 30 foot thick. And knocked you down. Mm -hmm. There was nobody under. Nobody got hurt. I was. Ne I was never. I've seen a lot of it fall. You know. Of course, uh, I was, when I was trimming the roof, I pulled a lot of slabs. It would maybe be. A ton of rock in them. Now, how do you pull a slab? Well, you had a was a roof bar and had a kind of a hook on it, and you'd get up there close to it. But you had to watch. That's you had to be know what you was doing, and make sure you wasn't underneath it. Hook this roof bar in there, and and you could pry them loose sometimes, and or maybe start beating on it around the edges and cut it loose so it would fall. If you couldn't pull it, and it was dangerous, while well, we'd always shoot it. We take half stick powder or stick powder, 
party that we thought it would take to knock it loose. And we just put a fuse on it and maybe a fuse be 40 feet foot long and what it take to reach the bottom. And we put this shot up there and light the fuse and then we'd get down, take the ladder down, take the ladder down and shoot it. Maybe we get it, maybe we wouldn't. We may have to shoot it two or three times. But we gradually get it to where that we thought it was safe. Of course, we never got one to where it was, you know, you could actually guarantee it. We could say it's as safe as we can get it. Now, we never had a slab that's like 100 feet long, 20, 30, 40 feet thick. What do you do with that slab? Well, they take jackhammers and get in there and drill it, shoot it. And pick it up if it had enough ore in it to pay. To pick it up. They, and they wanted to on the other side. They generally cut a cut a roadway through it, shoot it, and pick it, pick it up wide enough that they could get a they could get a truck through. Did you have any risk supports in the mines? You just left the left pillars. Well, how what's the distance between pillars? Uh, well, uh, they vary. Sometimes anywhere from 30, 40 feet. I've seen them as high as 150, 200 feet apart. So far, it would have plumb out of reach. But that's the reason that they, that it got so dangerous. The mining companies got hogs, and those fellers had four in them. And nine chances, any time you left the feller, it was right in where there was a good bunch of four. All right, but they wanted this open. And the only way they could get it was to shoot it out. And that's where the gougers come in after the mining. Well, the mining company's done a lot of it themselves. But the gougers come in and they, that's the only one that was left that was, was paid up. Now, if they could ask, actually make any money. Now, what's the gouger? He was, the gouger is a, he was, they were guys that come in, you know, and lease it from, say, from Eagle Fetcher or American Lead, and they, mine this here and gutted them out, you know, and took whatever they could. Of course, the mining companies, they got a percent. They made a little money off it, but they couldn't get men to do it and uh, to pay the way they had to offer it. Is that why the Grand Rap picture is sinking? That's right. We shot the fellas out of it. What do you fact, do? I helped do it. Whenever that ground starts sinking, what do you do? You don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. I can remember when they set a drill rig in front of the bank in Petra, Oklahoma. They drilled a hole down. They were supposed to afford, supposed to afford a concrete pillar to catch it. And they were supposed to tuck out a big pillar there. I never seen it, but I heard that the pillar was worth a million dollars in land. The Eagle Fisher pulled it out. They never did get the, they poured some concrete down there, I think. But they never did hold it. The bank and Fisher fell in. It's KD today. The Eagle Fisher Mining Company. I've seen the drill rig. This is setting up that drill in the hole. Yeah. And on, on second and main. So it was cave in about the major mine disaster you had. That's right. And outside of the, like I say, once in a while a man gets a little reckless with a stick of dynamite. A lot of people have got fingers blowed off with dynamite gas. And so but generally always you didn't make but one mistake. Yeah. So from thirty eight to forty three, how many different jobs did you have in the mine? Well, I started out as just a machine helper or what's called a dummy. Then I started running the running the machine, which was a that was a top job. You got top pay for that. And of course, uh, I trimmed roof in between time, and that was a top paying job. And you never had to work eight hours. If you worked three or four hours a day, you was you was doing good. You put in a day's work, and uh, and uh, was a boss. For a while, American Land. Okay, well, you were a boss. What was your job? Well, I 
I was over the, I was I was over the over the machine men and the, and the shelter. Mm-hmm. Of course, they had another man ahead of the, over me that was was a general general ground ball. How did the beginning of World War II affect the mines? Uh, when World War II started, uh, they claimed that uh, they needed all the lead and zinc they could get. So uh, they went to paying what's called a subsidy. So much per ton for, for rock, which was paid for by the, by the federal government. And um, they done that in order to get, get more more lead and zinc and to, and to mine poor dirt. Rock that didn't have so much so much lead and zinc in it, but we still had a lot of good uh, a lot of good rock there. Had a lot of lead and zinc in it. Run 12, 13 percent. A lot of it did. Uh, but so uh, way we kept it down was we would shoot down white rock to go in with this good dirt in order to keep from the federal government cutting off the subs. Yeah, it's kind of kind of crooked, but nevertheless, it was done. Yeah. In fact, I I've helped build it. <laughs> the mining industry also gave you permits. Then, uh, of course, you know uh, they claimed it was a national doing something for the for the country. You know, if you worked in the mines, and they would get you a permit if you wanted one. I never had one in my life. I don't know how I stayed out, but uh, they just never did call me till I quit my job in 1943, and I wouldn't go back. How come you quit in 43? I got into it with a boss, and he said I had to do a certain thing. I said I don't have to do anything. I quit, and I got a, I got a different classification in about two or three weeks. Then I went in the Marine Corps. Went in the Marines in 43. Mm-hmm. Where did you take your basic? San Diego. How long did that last? 16 weeks. Anything happen to basic that sticks out in your mind? Oh, a little rough. There wasn't any rougher. What the, I was from a rough town. I was used to it. How big was Petra in those early days? Uh, Petra was a fair sized town. They had probably, I, I, don't, I don't know what you could call the population, but it was, I'd say 30, 40,000. It was a pretty good sized little town. Treese was the same way. Now, where Wall Falls. Yeah. Where's Treese it's, located? It's, north of, it's just north across the state line from Petra, okay. over in Kansas. On the west. Fetcher, uh, Fetcher, at one time had uh, had uh, that's it, one had three theaters, and uh, there's quite a bit of commotion there. They had three theaters, several restaurants. I don't know how many. A couple of three dry goods stores. A lot of beer joints. <laughs> <laughs> there was a beer joint on every corner. Was this during Prohibition or after Prohibition? Oh, that's during Prohibition. How'd you get away with it? Oh, I don't know. We always we could always manage to get a gallon of whiskey up in 42. Say, so what about bootleggers? Oh, yeah. I got to tell you about that. <laughs> in fact, I guess everybody was a bootlegger during, during the Depression. I don't care who you was. If you live in Petra, Oklahoma, you're a bootlegger. <laughs> Uh, we used to haul whiskey from Corona, Kansas. And sometimes we would come the back way. We were back over west of, of 69 Highway and through the country road in order to get to Petra. Mm-hmm. But uh, the quickest way was right down 69 Highway through Columbus and on into Petra. But we'd haul, we'd haul whiskey in there. I made a few trips up there. Have you caught? 
an old man that knocked a guy off the running board on the a model board one time, knocked a policeman off the uh, off the running board there. The policeman jumped up on his on his car and to stop him he had a load of whiskey. And uh, he got wrecked over in the seat and got a ball bean hammer and warped, warped him between the eyes. He he went on down to he went on down to the garage on Second Street and Connell. Drove in there and unloaded the whiskey and went down to the police station and told them somebody tried to hijack him down there. <laughs> went, down to, went down to see who it was. And this old boy, I, I, I could call his name, but I'm not going to. Because I know some people. <laughs> they do that. But anyway, they, uh, they uh, told him that the, this hijacker tried to hijack him. He said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I knocked him. Hit him in the head with a ball beat hammer. He laying up there side of the road. Went up there as a police. Well, well, you know, we, laws order up there, Well, we had we had laws and and yeah, I mean, and you stuff. can beat your wife and kids and stuff. The government would do anything you would beat up to do. That's the truth. But we, uh, I've been in the Petra jail several times. It didn't keep me very long. It couldn't keep me very long because I owed the beer joints too much, and I had to get out till I go to work Monday morning. I can remember. In, in, that's your point. My check wouldn't pay my whiskey bill. I owed, I owed George Hall and Albury my check. Mm -hmm. Of course, I could drink a lot of whiskey. They own all the saloons? No. That's generally where I hung out. Oh. Mm -hmm. Whenever you haul the whiskey, you just haul it in the backseat of your car or yeah. where? Yeah, they haul it in the backseat. They had no tanks built in or any false tanks or anything like that. They didn't actually want to catch you. And besides, uh, it took more than one law enforcement or one or two to catch you because they didn't want to mess with you. Mm -hmm. You know, when you tell a man to leave you alone, he generally, they didn't want to wind up in the bottom of one of those chairs. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it has happened. I was going to say, it happened very much? Well, not that I really know of too much, but I know, I know a laws up there that it got warped up one side and down the other several times. Mm -hmm. There was people that would think about missing and they never did find them. So they had to be drawn in or pushed in or something. Mm -hmm. They didn't particularly tell if they found them or not. But it was a, it was pretty tough little town. And uh, all boom towns are that way. I don't care what it was. Or Oklahoma or, or Tulsa. Did they have a red light district up there? Oh, yeah. What's our town do? It's on 4th Street. 4th Street. Yeah. I, I don't like their measure, but I know where it was at. <laughs> Who are some of the big madams up there? Do you know? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call them names. <laughs> I was, but I got a good lesson. I got a good education, Petra. I'm not ashamed of the town. I'm not ashamed of anybody know that I'm from Petra. I got a good education there. I got education enough to get out of it. And uh, some of these days I may go back. So there's a lot of people up there I like. I know I still know a few people up there. Do you have any experiences in the mines that stick out in your memory? Besides the cave in, anything that about the uh, the roughest part I've ever and the saddest thing I have ever seen up there. Just to see you. Little people with nothing to eat. I have seen men sitting on the sidewalk in Petra, Oklahoma, of picking up cigarette butts. That was during the Depression. That's during the Depression. And then during the 30s. And that, they didn't have 
I've seen the soup lines when you, what they call soup lines. They had a kitchen there where they made this soup. They throwed everything in it, I guess they could get in it, including the dish rag. And uh, you go down every morning and get a bucket of soup. Now, a lot of the people done that. Who sponsored those soup lines? Sir? Who sponsored the soup lines? Well, I think, uh, I, I, I think the federal government did. I think that was money that would give to four states. I don't, I don't really know anything about it outside of what I've, I've seen, mm -hmm. and I've seen it happen. I guess I was very fortunate that my folks didn't do that. But I, I know when I went to work in the mine, it said 30 days, things was tough. And I know then that they used to test me because I had a job and some of the some of the other people that didn't, but had a family, didn't have one. Which is always, always the people that that are worse than the ones that won't. Because it's always been there's a has and the have not, which will always be. And I always thought those people could find a job if they wanted one. But it was kind of it was kind of sad. In fact, I don't want to, I don't want to see it again. From uh, the Snellers up here in Barbersville, do they bring any of that ore from the mines over there? I haven't. I, I don't know what exactly, but I think I think that's a part of this. I, I think that's a, is a zinc smelter at Bartlesville. Yeah, right. But uh, I think some of the zinc from Picker went to Bartlesville. Now we had a smelter at Galena. That's where the lead went to, which was a lead smelter. You get lead poison down the mine. Sure do. Now, uh, I've seen people that had lead poison at Galena, Kansas. The vegetation around the Galena lead smelter was all dead when it was operating. It, I guess it was caused from the smoke and the and the lead poison. And it, those people all those people who worked in those lead smelters, they died all died young, just like the miners. There's a many of a man in those mines and lead smelters that died at 40, 45 years old. They were big husky men. And were husky men until they got sick, and when they got sick, they didn't they didn't last very long. I have a couple of three uncles that had died around 40 years old. They work in the mines all their life, that's all they know. So you get lead poison from the smelters, can you get it from the mines too? Uh, I never heard tell of anybody actually just getting what's called lead poison from them. What you always got with silicosis, which was rock dust on your lungs. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have an idea probably lead had something to do with it. But I don't think you could get lead poisoning. You know, well, I think the lead poisoning you got was from the smoke yeah. around those furnaces. Okay. But not a, I never worked in the smelter. Marines. Where did you go overseas with the Marines? The main, the main guys in the in the mine, most certainly, we we had the, we had hand shovels, what you call. We used to get them out of Blue Jacket and Jay and Welch and all them. We called them surf bucket miners. Surf bucket miners. Mm -hmm. They would come in there. They lived on a farm out there. They carried their lunch in they a bucket. They would bucket. they would actually come in there with a put their lunch in a surf bucket. A gallon surf bucket during hard times. The depression was we bought lots of hair roll surf and a gallon bucket. And they always had to had their surf bucket and they had them a sandwich in there and a half of A lot of them I've seen them, many of one of them come in there with a with a old slab side of salt pork and a cold biscuit. Fried salt pork. That's all they had. And, uh, but anyway, they was, but they didn't stay long. But they always just come in, you know, when, in all times in the farm. They, because their main source of income was on the farm. Mm -hmm. And they lived on those little, those little farms out there, which was, which was 
then was the family, what we call the family farm. Yeah. There's no such thing as a family farm anymore. Well, don't get in the van. Uh, how big are these mines underground? How far do they go? They, uh, you could go from, uh, if it had to been for any water or cavings. I know you could have went from the Rialto mine to the to the old back east to the Dardine in the back, and I think they finally cut. It. I know they did. They cut it through plumb into the. Uh, you could go plumb to the uh, probably to the Leopard. How far is that? Uh, that'd be two miles, about two miles west of Baxter. That's all underground. Mm -hmm. All underground. Baxter's in Kansas. And that, that would be over in Kansas, which would be approximately three miles. That's a crow flies. Underground, of course, you said it would probably take, <laughs> if you could, had to walk it and get through. But there was a lot of water, you know, some of them filled up in water in low places. And stuff How do you like keep that. the water out of the mines? Had pumps. How big are these pumps? Well, I used to work on a six inch triplex, which is an old piston pump. Mm -hmm. Grease slingers, as we call them. And then uh, I worked on, I would run pumps of that six inch triplex, Camerons, centrifugals. I pumped at the, uh, run pumps at the old Leopard. West of Baxter Springs and pumped that rusty water out. We had two 10 inch Pomona's, a 6 inch triplex, a Cameron, and two and a 2 inch centrifugal. It wasn't rusty water, it was alkali water. Anyway, uh, it was what, it was rusty water, what I just called it rusty water, but it was alkali water. And it ran over east and across military in Baxter and into Spring River. And I run the I run the pumps there for a while. Long ago, you forgot to mention the horse for a minute. Well, it wasn't in the ground. No, but he gets you up and down. What does he do? He uh, well, we had the, had the horse run it up. They run the horse on top. Mm -hmm. You know, in the dairy. And that's down in the can down in the. Mm -hmm. Sure. How is. many men get in this can? Four. Four. I've Four. seen as high as six right here, but two standing on the rim. But actually, four of them was what was supposed to ride in the can. I've seen more than that get in the can, but ordinarily, four is what you're supposed to. This is the last, the last mine that was left standing up there. Called We Saw, I think. That's called what? We Saw. That's an old, the last one standing one. Now, what what build, what does this building do? What is this? This is a dairy. Mm hmm. This is a hopper. Is that right? Mm -hmm. and this is a shaft where they go up and down into the ground. Okay. Now what what's a hopper used for? What's well the hopper is where they where they dump this dirt. And I don't never did know just how many cans that, that hopper would hold. Uh, my guess is probably somewhere around eight, nine hundred. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it would hold any more than that. Now, after it's taken from the can into the hopper, where does it go? Some of the places used to have a mill right there at the dairy. They had a mill there, like the Rialto did at one time. They had mills. And it went right into the mill, and the rest of the waste all went out on the tailing pile, and then uh, went out on the, the lead and the zinc, and had the it, it went in the orbit. Now, how did the mill operate? How did it crush up the rock and all that? Well, this, this, this rock, it goes through a, it goes through what they call the breaker. Crusher. Crusher. And that busts these big boulders. How did they crush them? Well, it's just a, two jaws coming, a jaw coming together like that. They're busting these boulders. Then we had a set of, had a set of rolls. And it went through the rolls. So how did they work? What did they Well, uh, this rock rolled off into the, end of the rolls and these rolls are rolling and it as it went in their way it crushed it. Then they had what they called a ball mill. Mm -hmm. After that some of this rock had pour in it that was so fine that uh, 
they couldn't get it out any other way. So it went into the ball mill and they floated it out with float machines. Now, I'm not a mill man, but I, I've been through them, you know, and kind of watched it. But I, I never did work it. Never did work in a mill because it didn't pay money enough. How many pounds of letters ink can you get out of like a ton of ore? Uh, I've seen zinc where it sometimes it'd be, I'd say, 80% zinc. And I've seen lead where we would shoot lead out. Maybe the, this vein of lead would be, I've seen it as high as a foot and a half thick. And the dirt would be plum blue. It would be blue. And it would be so heavy that you couldn't pick up a shovel full of it. How many I've, seen, I've seen chunks of it that you go to reach down to pick it up and you didn't pick it up. It wouldn't be over maybe twice as big as a water bucket. And you couldn't pick it up. It's just, it's just so much lead in there. How many pounds could a man shovel in one day? A good a good shoveler could uh, could shovel about if he was really good could shovel about between seventy and eighty cans. That's by hand. By hand. Of course, when we got power equipment, I've seen them load as high as one hundred and fifty. Yeah. One. One show a uh, one operator. Mm -hmm. Now in the coal mines, they have black lung. What do you have in the lead and zinc mines? We have what they call uh, silicosis which is rock dust on your lungs. We, when I was a kid, we always called it the roof. Mm -hmm. They always say so-and-so's got the roof. So it's but just... There was nothing in the world but silicosis. Just so it's rock meant, dust on the, on the lungs. Rock dust on their lungs. They got it from being in tight places in those mines. They wasn't cut together then. And the fumes off the powder and the dust was bad. No circulation. Did you have any way to force air down in those mines? They had the, they had blowers in. They've had ever since I can remember. They've had blowers, and then they'd maybe run a sail down the drift. Now what's the sail? Well, it would just be a cloth pipe, what we call a sail, and uh, force air down the drift, like up in the end of a pool drift, to blow it out some, you know. But it always took time to get that all up there. Because if they left it hang, some wild-haired machine man would shoot it all to pieces. He'd load his holes a little heavy and shoot it up. And it took time to get it in there. Mm -hmm. now, the other trouble we had was with some of them wouldn't wet the dirt pile down. Now, what does it do? What does wetting the dirt pile down do? Well, it's the rock you would say we shot out today in the, in the morning. Why they wouldn't water it down. And it would be dusty. When you watered it, it settled the dust. Of course, when you watered it down, it settled the dust some, you know. But there was, anytime you move dust and throw it around, or dirt and throw it around like that, you're going to have some dust. And uh, we always had problems with that. Now, do you take your own lunch in the mine with you? Each miner take his own lunch. That's right. Take his you own lunch. Dog and then you, some of them eat out in the doghouse, some of them, at, like, the shovelers or uh, shovel off when when we first shovel or started and had the hand shovelers. Why they always took their lunch in the ground because they didn't want to lose any time. They wanted to get shovel every can of dirt they could because every time they got one, why in my time when I started around nine ten cents is what they got. Every time they got one, that's another dime, and they needed every dime. Well, how do you how do you keep track of how many cans you? They had paddles. They're made out of powder boxes, so it's a, these powder boxes like we got dynamite in, mm -hmm. and they made a, a board about uh, they were wood about wood. three about three inches wide and about six seven inches long, kind of sharpened them on the end. And every hand shovel had a number, like one, two, and on up. And you put your number on on these boards and then when they're on these paddles and then when it went into the shaft by well, the tub of it, why he tallied this number mm -hmm. on the board. But uh, Joe Blow had so many, so many cans of dirt that day.
stayed 50, 55, 60, whatever he had shoveled. And he got so much. And then the, the Colkey herder, he always took that tally and turned it in. And now he got so much for every king. What's a Colkey herder? Yeah, what is that? Well, Colkey herder, he's just a guy that he just, he's the boss over the hand show. That's all. Or, or at least he never had anything to do with me. Yeah. Because I was, a, <laughs> I was a machine man, and uh, mm -hmm. the biggest part of the time, yeah. outside of what time I wasn't a roof trimmer, I'd done a lot, quite a bit of roof trimming, too, because I was good, and I was, I was small, and I could, I know how to handle a ladder, which is very, was, you know, kind of rare. Most guys are, are afraid of heights. Yeah. And I, it, 40 fifty foot never bothered me. And I always got more money for it. What's the doghouse? Well, that's uh, the, just a building on top. Uh, I guess you're talking about on, on top where we change clothes. Okay. In the morning. Okay. And that's the doghouse. That's the doghouse. Okay. And, uh, of course, uh, some of the places had showers in there. Had hot and cold water. If we could find somebody to build a barn to keep it. Keep the water. You mean back in the 30s they had hot and cold running water in there? Some of them did. Anyway, uh, but, uh, and we had in our houses. They didn't have hot and cold running water in their houses. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> anyway, uh, but then we had a dog house in the ground right at the bottom of the shaft where that they, uh, just a platform, it's all it was. Just wouldn't put a platform. Lots of times it wouldn't be over four or five foot squared, maybe ten foot long, something like that. But where they set the can, where they set the empty can on. And they always rolled the, the car in with the loaded can underneath the shaft, which was supposed to have been centered in the center of the shaft. And the hooker, he would hook this loaded can on, the, on, the, in, on his cable. They'd pull it out. Then he would roll the empty off on the car. And then they had a what's called a bumper, which pulled this empty out, and he'd shove another load back under there. Was the man the bumper? Anyway, uh, that's uh, that's kind of the way that works. And then later on, we got what we call shuttle cars, which was operated by air. And we, we got rid of the bumpers, and they built a hopper in the ground. This dirt went into this hopper on in the ground, and the the hooker always had to, to load his own cans. Mm -hmm. They kind of got mechanized, you know, to work. They could cut out, cut out a couple of dollars, which the mining companies was 400%. Yeah. Uh, now, you say your father was a miner also. That's right. What were the major changes in the mine from the, your father's time to your time? Well, uh, when I first started, it, it, it had been uh, that been about the same all the time from the time I started up until when I started, and then, uh, and then we started getting power equipment like air shovels and uh, wasn't but a, a year or two till we got diesel trucks in the ground. And then we got these diesel loaders. How'd you get diesel trucks down the line? They cut them. There was no cabs on them, and they just cut them up. You just let the frame down with a motor on it, and then they let the bed down, and they put it on down there. They assembled them down so there. They assembled the trucks underground. That's right. And, uh, of course, there was nothing on them, no fenders. If they got a fender on them, why? They, some welder down there had to put it on Ever been a cave in? I've been within a couple hundred feet of one. What happened? Knocked me down. Happened at the old Mary M. Beck. There was a slab of rock fell. It was probably 150 foot long, 50 foot wide, 30 foot thick. knocked you down. Mm -hmm. There was nobody under. Nobody got hurt. I was ne I was never, I've seen a lot of it fall, you know, 
course, uh, I, when I was trimming roof, I pulled a lot of slabs. It would maybe be a ton of rock. You know. How do you pull a slab? Well, you had a, was a roof bar and had a kind of a hook on it, and you'd get up there close to it, but you had to watch. That's, you had to be know what you was doing and make sure you wasn't underneath it. Hook this roof bar in there, and and you could pry them loose sometimes, and or maybe start beating on it around the edges and cut it loose until it would fall. If you couldn't pull it, and it was dangerous, while well, we'd always shoot it. We would take half stick powder or stick powder, whatever we thought it would take to knock it loose, and we just. Put a fuse on it, and maybe a fuse be 40 feet foot long, and what it take to reach the bottom. And we put this shot up there, and light the fuse, and then we get down, take the ladder down, take the ladder down, and shoot it. Maybe we get it, maybe we wouldn't. We may have to shoot it two or three times, but we gradually get it to where that we thought it was safe. Of course, we never got one to where it was. You know, you could actually guarantee it. We could say it's as safe as we can get it. Now, whenever you have a slab that's like 100 feet long, 20, 30, 40 feet thick, what do you do with that slab? Well, they take jackhammers and get in there and drill it, shoot it, and pick it up. If it had enough ore in it to pay, mm -hmm. to pick it up. They, and they wanted two on the other side. They generally cut them. Cut a roadway through it, shoot it, and pick it, pick it up wide enough that they could get a they could get a truck through. Did you have any roof supports in the mines? You just left the left pillars. Well, how what's the distance between pillars? Uh, well, uh, they vary sometimes anywhere from 30, 40 feet. I've seen them as high as 150, 200 feet apart. So far, it would. The plumb out of reach. But that's the reason that they that it got so dangerous. The mining companies got holes and those fellers had four in. And nine chances of ten any time you left the feller, it was right in where there was a good bunch of ore. All right, but they wanted this open. And the only way they could get it was to shoot it out. And that's where the gougers come in after the mining well the mining company's done a lot of it themselves. But the gougers come in and they that's the only one that was left that was, was paid up. Now, if they could ask, actually make any money. Now, what's the gouger? He was, the gouger is a, he was, they were guys that come in, you know, and lease it from, say, from Eagle Fetcher or American Lead, and they mined this here and gutted them out, you know, and took whatever they could. Of course, the mining companies, they got a percent. They made a little money off it, but. They couldn't get men to do it and uh, to pay the way they had to offer. Is that why the Grand Rap picture is sinking? That's right. We shot the fellers out of it. What do you that's do? I helped do it. Whenever that ground started sinking, what do you do? You just don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. I can remember when they set a drill rig in front of the bank in Petra, Oklahoma. They drilled a hole down. They were supposed to, supposed, supposed to have poured a concrete pillar there to catch it. And they, they were supposed to tuck out a big pillar there. I never seen it, but I heard that the pillar was worth a million dollars in land. The Eagle Fisher pulled it out. They never did get the. They poured some concrete down there, I think. But they never did hold it. The bank and Fisher fell in. Escaped it. Eagle Fisher Mining Company. I've seen the drill rig. That was setting up that drill in the hole. Yeah. And on, on second and main. So it was cave in about the major mine disaster you had. That's right. And outside of, like I say, once in a while, man gets a little reckless with. A stick of dynamite. A lot of people have got fingers blowed off with dynamite gas. And so but generally, from, always you didn't make but one mistake. Yeah. So from 38 to 43, how many different jobs did you have in the mine? Well, I started out as just a machine helper 
or what's called a dummy. And then I started running them, running the machine, which was a that was a top job. Yeah. You got top pay for that. And of course, uh, I trimmed the roof in between times, and that was a top paying job. And you never had to work eight hours. If you worked three or four hours a day, you was you was doing good. You put in a day's work. And I uh, was a boss for a while, American Land. Okay, and was you a boss? What was your job? Well, I, I was over Ram there. Boss. I was, I was over the, over the machine man and the, and the shelter. Mm -hmm. Of course, they had another man ahead of the, over me that was, was a general, general ground boss. How did the beginning of World War Two affect the mine? Uh, when World War II started, uh, they claimed that uh, they needed all the lead and zinc they could get. So uh, they went to paying what's called a subsidy. So much per ton for, for rock, which was paid for by the, by the federal government. And um, they done that in order to get, get more, more lead and zinc into, into mine for dirt. Rock that didn't have so much, so much lead and zinc in it, but we still had a lot of good, uh, a lot of good rock there. Had a lot of lead and zinc in it. Run 12, 13 percent. A lot of it did. Uh, but so uh, the way we kept it down was we would shoot down white rock to go in with this good dirt in order to keep from the federal government cutting off the subs. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of crooked, but nevertheless, it was done. Yeah. In fact, I have I helped do it. <laughs> but the mining industry also gave you permits. Yeah. Out of war. And then, uh, of course, you know, uh, they claimed it was a national doing something for the for the country. You know, if you worked in the mines, and they would get you a permit if you wanted one. I never had one in my life. I don't know how I stayed out, but uh, they just never did call me till I quit my job in 1943, and I wouldn't go back. How come you quit in 43? I got into it with a boss, and he said I had to do a certain thing. I said I don't have to do anything. I quit, and I got a, I got a different classification in about two or three weeks. Then I went in the Marine Corps. Went in the Marines in 43. Mm -hmm. Where did you take your basic? San Diego. How long did that last? 16 weeks. Anything happen to basic that sticks out in your mind? Oh, a little rough. There wasn't any rougher than what I, I was from a rough town. I was used to it. How big was Pitcher in those early days? Uh, Pitcher was a fair sized town. They had probably, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what you would call the population, but it was, I'd say 30, 40,000. It was a pretty good size little town. Treese was the same way. Now, where Wall Fall. Yeah. Where's Treese located? It's, north of, it's just north across the state line from Pitcher, okay. over in Kansas. On the west. Uh, Petcher, Petcher at one time had, uh, had, uh, let's see, one, had three theaters. And, uh, there's quite a bit of commotion there. They had three theaters, several restaurants, I don't know how many, a couple of three dry goods stores. Oh, thank you for a lot of beer joint. <laughs> <laughs> there was a beer joint on every corner. Was this during Prohibition or after Prohibition? Oh, that's during Prohibition. How'd you get away with it? Oh, I don't know. We always we could always manage to get a gallon of whiskey and muffin 40 cents. You say, what about bootleggers? Oh, yeah. I, I got to tell you about that. <laughs> in fact, I guess, 
Everybody was a bootlegger during, during the Depression. I don't care who you was. If you live in Baker, Oklahoma, you're a bootlegger. Uh, we used to haul whiskey from Corona, Kansas. And sometimes we would come the back way. We were back over west of, of 69 Highway and through the country road in order to get to Baker. Mm -hmm. But uh, the quickest way was right down 69 Highway through Columbus and on the end of But we'd haul, we'd haul whiskey. I made a few trips up there. Have you caught? No. I know a man that knocked a guy off the running board on the A model board one time, knocked the policeman off the uh, off the running board there. The policeman jumped up on his on his car and to stop him he had a load of whiskey. And uh, he uh wrecked over in the seat and got a ball bean hammer and warped warped him between the eyes. He he went on down to he went on down to the garage on 2nd Street and Connell, drove in there and unloaded the whiskey and went down to the police station and told them somebody tried to hijack him down there. <laughs> went, down to, went down to see who it was, and this old boy, I, I, I could call his name, but I'm not going to, because I know some people <laughs> they do that. But anyway, they, uh, they uh, told him that the, this hijacker tried to hijack him. He said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I knocked him. Hit him in the head with a ball feet hammer. He's laying up right side of the road. Went up there as a police. <laughs> well, we all we, well, we, 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 we had we had laws and and, yeah, and you uh, can beat your wife and kids. And that's the government or do anything you're big enough to do. That's the truth. But we, uh, I've been in the Petra jail several times. It didn't keep me very long. It couldn't keep me very long. Because I owed the beer joints too much. And I had to get out till I go to work Monday morning. I can remember in, in country when my check wouldn't pay my whiskey bill. I owed, I owed George Hall and Albury my check. Mm -hmm. Of course, I could drink a lot of whiskey. They own all the saloons? No, that's generally where I hung out. Oh. Mm -hmm. Whenever you haul the whiskey, you just haul it in the back seat of your car or where? Yeah, they haul it in the back seat. They had no tanks built in or any faults. Tanks or anything like that. They didn't actually want to catch you. And besides, uh, it took more than one law enforcement or one or two to catch you because they didn't want to mess with you. Mm -hmm. You know, when you tell a man to leave you alone, he generally, they didn't want to wind up in the bottom of one of those shafts. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it has happened. I was going to say it happened very much. Well, not that I really know of too much, but I know I know a lot up there that it got warped up one side and down the other several times. Mm -hmm. There was people that would think about missing and they never did find them. So they had to be drawn in or pushed in or something. Mm -hmm. They didn't particularly care if they found them or not. But it was a it was a pretty tough little town, and uh, all boom towns are that way. I don't care whether it was Hunter, Oklahoma, or or Tulsa. Did they have a red light district up there? Oh yeah. What's our town do? It's on Fourth Street. Fourth Street. Yeah. I, I don't like their measurement. I know where it's at. <laughs> Who are some of the big madams up there? You know? No, I I wouldn't. I wouldn't call them names. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they don't say. I know one of what was her name. Everybody knew her. That's no secret. But that's a. No, I. I guess I was. But I got a good lesson. I got a good education. I'm not ashamed of the town. I'm not ashamed of them. anybody know that I'm from Fletcher. I got a good education there. I got education enough to get out of it. And uh, some of these days I may go back. So there's a lot of people up there I like. I know I still know a few people up there. Do you have any experiences in the mind that stick out in your memory? Besides 
tried to cave in anything that about the uh, the roughest part I've ever been the saddest I mean I have ever seen this thing. Just to see you. Little people with nothing to eat. I have seen men sitting on the sidewalk in Fisher, Oklahoma, of picking up cigarette butts. That was during that's during the depression. In the, during the 30s, and that they didn't have. I've seen the soup lines when you, what they call soup lines. They had a kitchen there where they made this soup. They throwed everything in it. I guess they could get in it, including the dish rag. Yeah. And uh, you go down in the morning and get a bucket of soup. Now a lot of the people done that. I Who sponsored those soup lines? Sir. Who sponsored the soup lines? Well. I think uh, I, I think the federal government did. I think that was money that would give to four states. Mm -hmm. but, um, I, don't, I don't really know anything about it outside of what I've, I've seen, mm -hmm. and I've seen it happen. I guess I was very fortunate that my folks didn't do that. But I, I know when I went to work in the mines at 38, Things was tough, and I know them that they used to cuss me because I had a job, and some of the, some of the other people there didn't. We had a family, didn't have one. Which is always, always the people that would have worked and the ones that won't. Because it's always been there's a haves and the have not, which will always be. I always thought those people could find a job if they wanted one. But it was kind of it was kind of sad. In fact, I don't want to I don't want to see it again. Yeah. From uh, the Snellers up here in Barbersville, mm -hmm. did they bring any of that ore from the mines over there? I haven't. I, I don't know what exactly, but I think I think that's a part of this. I, I think that's a is a zinc smelter at Barbersville. Yeah. Right. But. Uh, I think some of the zinc from Fisher went to Bartlesville. Now we had a smelter at Galena. That's where the lead went to, which was a lead smelter. Mm -hmm. yeah, you get lead poison down sure the do. mines? You sure do. Yeah, I've seen people that had lead poison. At Galena, Kansas, the vegetation around the Galena lead smelter was all dead when he was operating. I guess it was caused from a smoke and the, the land and the mine, both. Mm -hmm. How long had she owned the land before they opened the mine? Well, actually, it belonged to my. She married Fred Wilbur, and he actually owned it. He was her second or third husband. Anyway, they lived in Monarch, and he, he his grandparents owned it. It was farmland to begin with. Where is Monarch? It's west of Pitcher. And it's north and west of Pitcher. It's right on a state line. I don't know how many miles it is. It's about two miles north and west of Pitcher. Just across the, the state line in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the little old town, Monarch, my granddad named it Monarch. And he owned a lot of rental. He owned all that land. It was a pasture. When did they first settle up there? My gosh, probably in the 1800s. And when they struck ore, they built the mine on the land. Then they started mining and uh, he owned all the land and he had little houses built and rented them to the miners. How big were these houses? Two room shacks. Are they modern? No. They had outdoor toilet, no running water in the house. Where was, where was the water supply? It came from a well, I think. I'm not positive. It, uh, it was a just a well. Had a well and trees. Or two had two wells and trees. Mm -hmm. Um uh, the water that came from 
that they got around in there was delivered and what they call uh, had a water truck with a mm -hmm. with a tank on it and yeah. uh, and they had wooden barrels whiskey barrels was what they were if you was lucky you had a you had a whiskey barrel mm -hmm. and after soaking it so long you could get the smell of the whiskey that would make pretty good drinking water but anyway uh, we uh, some people had two barrels some people just had one. And we throw a wash tub over the barrel. Keep the barrel. Now we do a wash tub over the barrel to keep the bugs out. Of course, in the summertime, you know, the water, it got pretty hot sitting out there. So then we take a screen jacket that they use in the mill to screen this rock hit and put around it. And we fill that full of dirt or gravel in order to keep, trying to keep the heat away from this wooden barrel. And they delivered this water to us on the, in this water truck. He generally come twice a week, and you get from one to two barrels of water. And now that water that you got, that had to be from for to drink and for to cook with and take a bath with. So two fifty-five gallon barrels of water twice a week is not too much water, according to the way they told the way to run it today. Just bath and galvanized wash tub. Just bath and galvanized wash tub. Some, some houses, a few, were fortunate enough at that time to have a an indoor bathroom and a bathtub and running water, but not not too many. Well, anyway, my grandmother had a big house, two stories, and it was all modern. But, uh, I had a bathtub and running water. In fact, I had two bathrooms and running water. My grandfather was a blind man. He went to blind school in Kansas City. He read Braille and wrote Braille. Mm -hmm. And every Christmas, they bought all the people that lived there big baskets of fruit. They bought all the children's shoes and heavy winter coats as presents and delivered them to them every Christmas at the time. Of course, they had the money. And nobody liked them because they was the landowner and the property owner, the landlord. And everybody thought they were stuck up, I guess you'd call it, what they always said. That they didn't like me when I was a kid because I had more than anybody else. I guess they envied me, I don't know. When's your birthday? May 15, 1919. 1919. And you were born in Monarch? No, I was born in Cherryville, Kansas on a farm. My dad came down to Monarch when I was about a year old. Went to work in the mines. And he worked in the mines until 19... 1927. He was a machine man. That's all he ever did. Machine and powder man. And he left the mines and moved out east to Pryor and leased the farm. And I actually grew up on a farm. I moved there when I was eight years old. About eight or nine years old. And he farmed till I was in or junior high. But he had asthma really bad and my husband claims he had minor T B too. And he died when he was forty two. Anyway, I went back to Monarch every summer for a two weeks vacation to stay with my grandmother. You know, that was our our treat. We got to go up there every summer and spend two weeks. But I knew a lot of those people. I had a lot of relatives. A lot of my mother's relatives lived there, and they were miners. And they were all, they had a rough time. They all, everybody up there had big families. They had from seven to nine children. And they lived in a two-room house. Most of the houses were two-room. 
had uh, what they called tar paper on the wall. They didn't have wallpaper. They just papered with that old green tar paper. Those people up there was mean and rough and tough, and I don't think there was anything they wouldn't do. I mean, you talk about streetwise, they were streetwise. Get drunk and fight and cut each other up with knives and all kinds of stuff. The men. And they got drunk and beat their wives and beat their kids, and that's just the kind of life they led. Sound like rough times. Yeah, it was. It was. There's nothing, nothing good about it. Did you bob your hair in the twenties? Yes, I've always bobbed my hair. I never had long hair. You didn't. No, and I did the Charleston when I was eight years old. Were you flapper? Yes, an ex flapper. <laughs> I'm proud of it. What is a flapper? I really don't know. <laughs> Somebody dances a lot, so all I knew. You wear short skirts? No, my dad wouldn't stand for that. And I never wore shorts. And he let you bob your hair, though? Yeah, and I wore out a pair of shoes every week. I had to have new shoes every Saturday, because I went to a dance every Saturday night. <laughs> dance from the time I got there till I left. Mm -hmm. I'd rather dance than eat. Where were these dances? Well, when I was in my, I guess, my late teens, I always went to Joplin, Missouri, every Saturday night to Bob Wilkes dance at Memorial Hall in Joplin. I'll never forget it. Every Saturday night. Mm -hmm. I didn't hang out in the beer joints. I wasn't allowed to go near those. I wasn't allowed to go with anybody that did. <laughs> I never had my first date until I was 16. And I, when I got out of high school, when I graduated, I went to live with my grandmother there in Monarch. And I went to business college in Miami and graduated. What was the name of it? Miami Business College. And I can't, I'm trying to think of the man and the woman that they owned it and they, it was theirs. But I can't think of their name right off. Anyway, I met him right after I got out of business college. We got married and we had three young children, four grandchildren. Anything more about the mines do you want to think well, of? One well, thing is about the water business, you know. We uh, we had good we had good drinking water there because of that that water was, was good then. Mm -hmm. But it got it got awful hot. Like it wasn't you know, we didn't waste it. And but of course in the summertime where well, we get that get ice, you know. Wintertime the water bar the water the water stayed cold because it always froze up. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, the water at that time up there was good water. And uh, it was good water up until, uh, uh, say, uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Because we always had people there that took care of the wells, you know. They always, always took a little bit of pride in it. And they work on these wells and build occasions, you know, put new occasions back in them. Well, I uh, understand they've had some problems up there with water. And what you claim that the alkali water eat the casings up. Well, they always eat them up. We always had the alkali water in there, and it was always eating them up. But they pulled them and, and replaced those casings. But I guess this last eight, ten years or something like that, I don't know what happened. They run out of money. I figured they could get some federal money to do it with, and they just let it go. And, uh, or get a block grant or something, or revenue sharing. Somebody somebody to pay their way. This clean of Tar Creek, is that going to work? Well, if they can 
keep the water out of Kansas from coming under under the ground. If they can stop the seepage water, which goes down those drill holes and, and, and down those shafts up there, and keep it away, it will work. But I don't think they can ever be, I don't, I don't believe they'll ever be able to do it. Because that alkali water, the, the, I'll say 90% of it comes out of Kansas. It is not in Oklahoma. That iron, there's not that much iron in on the Kansas side. And but if they if they can keep it away, they they can do it. Now it's always the iron has always been there, but they pump it, and it has always been a pollutant. It went into Grand River years ago. It had no place else to go. It had to go into Tar Creek. And from Tar Creek, it had to go into Grand River. But they pumped it out, and it went into Spring River, and it had to go into into Grand River. So it was always a pollutant. Always had been. The water, the the alkali water, they used to pump it from the old Chubb mine, and it run down the state line in a ditch on the Oklahoma side, and into Tar Creek within two blocks of where we lived. That was in the 1930s. It done it. I mean, in the early 30s. They had done that. And the, the water was red there. Now, that was in, that, now that, that was over in Kansas, where this, they pumped the water off the Kansas side. But they run, it run across the road and over on the Oklahoma side. And down the down the state line and in the tar tree. Every open ditch and every pond had that alkali water in it. I mean, it was orangey red. It was all. It has always oh, been. Water. It's always been alkali water there. Mm -hmm. If it's been, uh, of course, and we went swimming in it. I was, the biggest part of the people of my age up there learned to swim in one of those ponds. I did. I learned to swim in the Weber Pond. A man throwed me in there. I had to swim. I, I guess he would have got me out. But I can remember him throwing me in. He was going to teach me to swim, and he did. Man. And I thought I, I swam in Tar Creek and the Bendelair and the, the Wilbur and the Chubb and the West Broom and the Gordon. All of those ponds I have, I've been swimming in them. I uh, hunted rabbits when I was a kid around all of them. There's not a foot of ground up there that I haven't walked from. Those of it. I killed I kill a lot of rabbits up there. Because uh, in the 30s, why, you know, of course, I still like rabbits. Man, this, you know, rabbits come. They taste pretty good when you. When you don't have anything to eat, and there was just a lot of people up there didn't have anything to eat. Mm -hmm. I can remember when we bought I bought eight shotgun shells for 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 a quarter. I went a hunting and I killed me eight rabbits. I didn't miss. And I come back and clean those rabbits and sell those rabbits for a dime a piece. I got a dime a piece for those rabbits. So I didn't. I I, I couldn't afford to miss. And if I could, if I could, I thought I could hit him with a rock. I didn't shoot at him. Now getting back to those towns back then, they were just like any other mining town, you know. That's just the way miners lived. Oh, the average salary in the mines. That's what it is. When I met him, he was making twenty dollars a week in 1941. That was a week's salary. Is that good wages? Well, it was. Then I, we, we could live on it. We could live on I could, I could pay rent, buy groceries, and make, make, car, payments. On, make car payments on $20 a week. Was that average, an average salary mm -hmm. back then? That was, that was good pay. There's a lot of people that didn't, didn't have anything. Well, the people worked in the mines had money, but there was a lot of people who didn't have work. A lot of people that didn't, didn't have work. When did those mines finally close? Sometime in um, around 58, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Now, is it still playing or up there? Or is it pretty well. Laid? No, it's it's pretty well. They're good. Well, there's, yeah. no, there's nothing left. There would be. There's some spots where that there would probably be some that you could get, but it it would cost so much now to get it. Those mines are all full of water. They'd have to it it take a trip. I don't know what kind of pumps you'd have to have now to beat that water. And because uh, as much of it as is there, a couple of three ten inch promoters is not going to touch it. Of course, after you got it all out, you know why they. Eagle Fisher had some big pumps over around Garden over there that could keep it down. But right now, it there is, you could it takes some it, it, it just take big irrigating pumps to, to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the mining is is all down there. They will never do any more. Anything they do about the ground sinking up there? There's not a thing they can do about it. How big of an area is sinking? Up there. Uh, practically everything up there from the Kansas state line two miles south is all undermined. Over as far as Quapaw. Now Quapaw is not cut too too bad in that because those were all shallow. Mm -hmm. Shallow stuff in there. And uh, they never cut them deep. Some of them fell in up around on uh, right next to the to 166 or to 66 highway, some of those uh, were sad. cut were cut pretty high in there. I think I never did work in there, but all I know is what I've heard, and I but I do do know some people that worked in there, and they say that some of them were cut pretty high. I wouldn't know the my mile, mile. I don't, but there that whole area in there around paper. See, it, from the best I can understand, the towns wasn't incorporated at that time. And the reason they kept them that way, so that the mining companies could mine under those towns. Or if they were incorporated, you couldn't, uh, we understand, you couldn't mine under So even it was all to the mining companies' benefit, benefit to, to do that, you see. And, uh, and they just cut them high and dry. They took everything they could. Awesome. If it had a shine in it, what we call any ore at all, they took it. And they didn't, it wasn't. They wasn't worried about the, what it done to it. Well, they have had several major cave-ins up there. And they were, and uh, cause Eagle Fetcher and those big Americans, Inc. or some of those big mining companies, they uh, got what they wanted, and then they said, "Well, boys, there it is. It's all yours." Now then, it belongs to them. It, it, it's Indian land. It belongs to it's Indian land and. I understand you can't buy any of it, so uh, it's up, left up to the state. What do they call to, that? To, to straighten it up, and when one of these days, uh, somebody's going to come up and say, "Well, we want it all straightened up." And uh, what's it going to take to, to straighten it up now in the shape of what it is now? Because they have hauled the tailings for gravel out, they put them on the highways out here, which were if. If that iron is, is a pollutant up there, it is out here on the highway too. And the reason they put it on the highway because it's hard rock. It don't wear out like this quarry rock that we get. And uh, if, it, if, it, if it'll pollute it up there, it will do it here. Same thing. And it's all over the state. From the best I can understand, they, they shift it all over the Especially the eastern part of Oklahoma. It is on the, on the roads. When you buy a house up there, you don't get the land. You just get the house. What do they call that? Well, they get, just get a, a mean, deed to it. Uh, but uh, and that's the reason that the, my opinion is that the town never did amount to very much because you couldn't, you couldn't buy, nobody wants to build a house or a piece of land they don't own. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't buy it because the mining companies had a lease on it. There's no way they would let you have it. Now then, it belongs to it's Indian land, and I understand they won't sell it either. I don't know what they want with it, because it, 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 nobody's going to build anything on it. Because it, it's liable, it's liable to be down the hole. You'll have to wake up one morning and you'll be down the hole. Did you know many of the Indians up there in that area? 
though I didn't. The big part of them was over around Fall Fall and a lot of them in Miami, and I never did run around over there. The only Indian I know over there was the next one by the name of Greenback. Alfonso Greenback. What about you, Miss Barr? Did you know many of you? No, I didn't know any of them. Well, I never even went to school with some Indian kids. You didn't. I went to school with some Indians, but they, you know, they never. Yeah. They, they, they was Indians was uh, nobody. As far as my part is concerned, nobody looked down on Indians then. There was no racial squabble or anything like that. Well, I think we have a good interview back in mind. Anything else y'all want to talk about? <laughs> no, not me. I don't know what else to tell you. Well, when, I, when, I, when I come back from the Marine Corps, well, I lived back when I went out. When you went in? When, when I went in. in. When I come back, I went back to Baxter. When I left there, well, I come to here. We lived in Trees, Kansas, which was a part of that area. One year after we got married. I said, that's enough for me. We're moving back, so I don't want to I live moved, here. I moved to Baxter, and I lived there until... I we moved got, to Tulsa. I moved to Tulsa. You've been here ever since? I got in the heating and air... I worked, worked in the heating and air conditioning business, worked two years, and I went to business for myself, and, and I owned Bar Heating and Sheet Metal Company, and, mm -hmm. and I retired here in April. April. In April. The economy got so bad. Housing business bad. All the constructions hit the bottom, so I figured. It, and you were 65. I was 65 years old, so I figured it's a good time to get out. I may go back in business again <laughs> if it if the money gets good. We'll be in town for 30 years the first day of. The if the construction business don't get good, well, I still have a license. I got my license. If it don't get good, why well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit back and take it easy. Sounds good, <laughs> Mr. Barr. Thank you. Yeah, I hope you don't plan on that. <laughs>
our journey. There's, yeah. not, there's nothing left. There would be, there's some spots where that there would probably be some that you could get, but it, it would cost so much now to get it. Those mines are all full of water. They'd have to, it'd, it'd take a trip. I don't know what kind of pumps you'd have to have now to beat that water. And, uh, cause as much of it as is there, a couple, three, ten inch from owners is not going to touch it. Of course, after you got it all out, you know why they, they go fetcher had some big pumps over around the garden over there that could keep it down. But right now, it, there is, you could, it takes some, it, it, it just take big irrigating pumps to, to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. But the mining is, is all down there, they will never do any more. Anything they can do about the ground sinking up there? There's not a thing they can do about it. How big is an area sinking up there? Uh, practically everything up there from the Kansas state line two miles south is all undermined. Over as far as Quawthaw. Now Quawthaw is not cut too too bad in that because those were all shallow. Shallow stuff in there. And uh, they never cut them deep. Some of them fell in up around on uh, Right next to the to 166 or to 66 highway, some of those uh, were cut were cut pretty high in there. I think I never did work in there, but all I know is what I've heard, and I but I knew do, do know some people that worked in there, and they say that some of them were cut pretty high. I wouldn't know the my mile, mile. I don't, but there that whole area in there around paper. See, it, from the best I can understand. The towns wasn't incorporated at that time. And the reason they kept them that way, so that the mining companies could mine under those towns. Or well, if they were incorporated, you could, uh, we understand you couldn't mine under So even it was all to the mining companies' benefit, benefit to, to do that, you see. And, uh, and they just cut them high and dry. They took everything they could. Awesome. If it had a shine in it, what we call any ore at all, they took it. And they didn't. It wasn't. They wasn't worried about the, what it done to it. Well, they had several major cave-ins up there. And they were, and uh, cause Eagle Fetcher and those big American Zinc and some of those big mining companies, they uh, got what they wanted, and then they said, "Well, boys, there it is. It's all yours. Now then, it belongs to them. It, it, it's Indian land. It belongs to it's Indian land." And, I understand you can't buy any of it, so uh, it's up, left up to the state. What do they call it? To, to, to straighten it up, and when one of these days, uh, somebody's going to come up and say, "Well, we want it all straightened up." And uh, what's it going to take to, to straighten it up now in the shape of what it is now? Because they have hauled the tailings for gravel out, they put them on the highways out here, which were. If that iron is, is a pollutant up there, it is out here on the highway too. And the reason they put it on the highway is because it's hard rock. It don't wear out like this quarry rock that we get. And uh, if, it, if, it, if it'll pollute it up there, it will do it here. Same thing. And it's all over the state. From the best I can understand, they, they shift it all over the Especially the eastern part of Oklahoma. It is on the, on the roads. When you buy a house up there, you don't get the land. You just get the house. What do they call that? Well, they get, just get a, a mean, deed to it. Uh, but uh, and that's the reason that the, my opinion is that the town never did amount to very much because you couldn't, you couldn't buy. Nobody wants to build a house or a piece of land they don't own. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't buy it because the mining companies had a lease on it. There's no way they would let you have it. Now then it belongs to it's Indian land, and I understand they won't sell it either. I don't know what they want with it, because it, 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 nobody's going to build anything on it, because it, it's liable to, it's liable to be down the hole. You'll have to wake up one morning and you'll be down the hole there. Did you know many of the Indians up there in that area? Uh, no, I didn't. The uh, biggest part of them was over around Quawfall, and a lot of them 
in Miami, and I never did run around over there. The only Indian I know over there was one by the name of Greenback. Alfonso Greenback. What about you, Miss Barr? Did you know many of the Indians? No, I didn't know any of them. Well, I never even went to school with any Indian kids. You didn't? I went to school with some Indians, but you know, they never. Yeah, they, they was, Indians was a, nobody, as far as my part concerned, nobody looked down on Indians then. There was no racial squabble or anything like that. Well, I think we have a good interview back in mind. Anything else y'all want to talk about? <laughs> no, not me. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else but tell you. When I, when, I, when I come back from the Marine Corps, well, I lived back when I went out. Well, you went in. When, when I went in, in, when I come back, I went back to Baxter. When I left there, well, I come to here. We mm -hmm. lived in Trees, Kansas, which was a part of that area. One year after we got married, and I said, "That's enough for me. We're moving back, so I don't want to live here." I moved, moved to Baxter, and I lived there until I we moved got, to Tulsa. I moved to Tulsa. You've been here ever since. I got in the heating and air. I worked worked in the heating and air conditioning business. Worked two years, and I went to business for myself. And, and I own Bar Heating and Sheet Metal Company. And, mm -hmm. and I retired here in April. By, in April. The economy got so bad. Yeah. Housing business bad. All the constructions hit the bottom. So I figured. That, and you were sixty-five. I was sixty-five years old, so I figured it was a good time to get out. I may go back and bend us again <laughs> if, it, if the money gets good. We'll be in town for 30 years the first day of the... Uh, if the construction business don't get good, well, I still have a license. I got my license. Yeah. If it don't get good, why well, I'm just going to sit back and take it easy. Sounds good. <laughs> Mr. Barr, thank you. Yeah, I hope you don't 